So welcome to the exhibit. It's called Reimagining the Americas. And the overall theme that we wanted to do was to really showcase millennia of history and prehistory in the entire Western Hemisphere, but shown mostly through the lens of indigenous achievements. We wanted to not focus solely on the then Columbus came, things were like this before, and then things changed, but rather to just look at native cultures on their own through their prehistoric artifacts. And we chose to begin with an Amazonian piece we have. This is a funerary urn um, from a region called the Maracá. And it is uh, located sort of in the northeastern delta of the Amazon River. And this is particularly interesting because they're relatively rare in museum collections, but also because the Amazon has probably been one of the most exciting fields of archaeological research in the New World recently. I think most of us tend to think of the Amazon as this vast jungle being fairly unpopulated, being home to all sorts of native plants and animals, but not so much to native peoples. And I think that is definitely being challenged in terms of there still being living tribes. There is deforestation, um, drilling for oil, and all sorts of natural resource exploitation has actually shown that, hey, there are people that, that still live here. But also archeologists are finding that people lived there anciently as well. In fact, there's now evidence for very complex and large cities, stratified civilization, um, the likes of which we had just never assumed. Part of ironic, sort of the ironic part about this is that it's actually a lot of that deforestation that has allowed archeologists to, to actually see what's in there. Uh, it's a jungle environment, so preservation tends not to be very good organics decompose in moist environments. Um, and a lot of what we find is coming from caves as well. And this piece here um, was, we don't have an exact convenience on it, but likely came from a cave where archeologists now are finding dozens upon dozens of these urns, either depicted as males, as you can see very clearly here. Some of them are female, some of them are unmarked. And the hypothesis is that they were secondary burials, that once um, the living had been buried, they would then be dug up and their bones would be placed in urns like this and then revered in caves as places of worship. So they were almost like cemeteries. So what happened? Well, a period of time after they died, and we have them. It's not cremation, it's just the No, it's not cremation. And honestly, we don't, archaeologists really don't no, this is again a hypothesis, um, and we're hoping that as excavation of actual sites, because it, it is very clear at this point that the residential sites were located nearby to these cave sites where um, pieces such as this have been found, but none of them have been discovered associated with other artifacts that might give us some information about how long people have been buried beforehand. So a lot of it is conjecture. Some of it's based on um, historical analogy, so looking at ethno-historic documents from some of the first European colonizers, as well as from ethnographic examples of people living in the region today in terms of how they treat and revere their dead. So unfortunately, we're hoping that, you know, if archaeology picks up in the region, that we'll have more answers. Yeah. Um, it's entirely terracotta, so it's clay, ceramic. Um, and there is evidence, actually, if, if you look very closely, and especially if you look at it under certain types of light, you can see that there are very, very faint traces of natural pigments. And there are other examples in other museum collections that show fairly elaborate painted surface decoration. And there's a long tradition in the Amazon of body paint. Um, covering, the paint, uh, covering the body with paints, tattoos, um, and so one of one of the hypotheses again is that the paint that was on there, which was in incredibly complex geometric patterns, might have actually reflected actual body painting practices. Yeah. At the time of these populated sites, can you <laughs> determine whether it was jungle conditions the way it is today? Yes, that's an excellent question. Did everyone hear it? Okay. Um, Yes, for this region in particular, in the Northeast Amazon Delta, there's uh, something called Terra Preta, which is these very dark, fertile um, jungle soils that show up on the tributaries of the Amazon River, and it's really excellent for farming. 
And so archaeologically what we're finding is that there are, yes, some artifacts and evidence that people were farming along these tributaries and these rivers um, in these dark soils and then living fairly close by, but their settlements were somewhat further away. But there's no evidence to suggest sort of a drastic deforestation in the way that, say, when we you know, talk about the Maya a little bit later on, that they were really clearing almost all of the land. There isn't as much evidence for that, although as deforestation is happening now and we're getting aerial images of some of just enormous complex cities, the likes of which we really didn't think had existed there, I think that's a question that's going to have to be reevaluated because in a lot of those places the jungle is very, very dense. Um, so I think yes and no. <laughs> Anything else? Should we move on to, oh yeah, sure. Uh, why, is, no, why is the figure like this? Why is the seating? Is there any cultural, religious background? Yeah, it's a really excellent question. Um, you'll notice that he is seated on a stool. It's more obvious if you get sort of a, a side view over there. You don't sit on, you don't sit on the table floor. <laughs> no, and stools, I think, nice. sort of cross-culturally. It was, you know, places as far flung as Africa and, you know, Asia, but particularly also in, in South American cultures, stools were uh, symbols of power, and certainly ethnographically we still see that um, stools play an important part in social hierarchy and distinguishing, you know, I don't want to go on the culture-nature dichotomy, but you know that it, it is a symbol of being cultured and not sitting directly on the dirt. And this example here, the stool is relatively unadorned by which I mean completely, it's, it's pretty simple. But in other examples um, that have been published in museum catalogs and some of the few books that have been published on Amazonian archaeology, they're very, they're very often zoomorphic. So they have animal shapes to them, um, particularly animals that are sort of dangerous and fast, like cheetahs and, or not cheetahs, jaguars, <laughs> um, and leopards and, and other you know, sort of predatory this next section of the exhibit is examining, as you can see from this map here, a pretty huge area, which is to say North America. And in this uh, portion of the exhibit, we looked at a couple of different themes um, based on prehistoric Native American artifacts. Um, and the first, the first aspect that we chose to discuss was what I think is by now a, a very famous question of who were the first people in the mm -hmm. Americas. Um, it's a controversial question, it's a loaded question, it is still an area of vigorous debate amongst anthropologists, archaeologists, and indigenous people themselves who don't believe that their ancestors came over from Russia or from anywhere else, but rather that they've always been here and that these archaeological theories about migration, um, they don't always accord mm -hmm. with their own beliefs. But right now, the, prime, or the, the most widely accepted archaeological explanation is that the first Native Americans came over to North America across the Bering Strait, which is this little uh, body of water that separates Alaska from Russia. And in the Ice Age, when things were a little bit colder, when four glaciers had melted, this, was actually, this had actually formed a land bridge, and they were able to walk over and slowly um, migrate and differentiate from one another. And I would invite you all to take a look at some of these very, very small artifacts, so just kind of as you filter back around, um, of some of the earliest lithic evidence we have for these um, early settlers, because it's they're, they're far from the simple tools that one might assume. They're very, very finely manufactured um, blades, hunting implements, from materials that are very difficult to work. So even though we're talking about dates as far back as 11,400 BC, so tens of thousands of years old, talking about very sophisticated technology and people who really did know what they were doing that we chose to explore three different broad regions and three different burning archaeological problems right now, things that are being vigorously discussed in the field. Um, but this is certainly not the totality of Native American archaeology, of Native American culture. Um, it was in part dictated by some of the strengths of the collection at the Hafenraffer Museum in terms of prehistoric artifacts. 
Um, but again, in part because these are very interesting questions that if you opened any you know, scholarly publication, even more popular publications like science or um, nature, you might see being discussed. So over here, this entire case uh, displays artifacts from the Arctic. And as you can see from the little map right up there, the Arctic encompasses an area from northern Alaska all the way through Canada and into Greenland, possibly as far as Iceland. There's, I, we can talk about that maybe after the tour. So we're talking about a vast geographic area. And what these artifacts are meant to show is, you know, and you can read each of the little labels if you want, was even though we're talking about a very, you know, a period of time that's fairly far removed, these people were connected in these vast trade networks and they were able to communicate with each other um, over vast differences, again, stretching from western Alaska all the way over to Greenland. Um, and some of the objects that they traded and used were made of very um, sort of wonderful raw materials. We've got um, some slate, we've got a lot of wood, carved ivory, again, materials that can be difficult to work. And there's definitely a degree of artistry that I think is quite appealing from just an aesthetic sense. So if everyone wants to come across and look at some of those pieces, I would invite you to do that. And then if afterwards, if anyone has a question about a specific object, please let me know. Not about an object, but do the peoples of the Arctic Rim still feel some sort of um, relation to one another other than the trade? That's a really good question, and I don't, I don't think there's just one answer to that. Um, I mean, my guess is in some ways, we've got things like modern transportation, modern methods of communication, which could, I think, make people feel more connected, and yet I think the reality is that we're seeing more modern world, as more modern issues are affecting people, you're seeing, you're seeing differences of opinion a lot between sort of what's important, but then at the same time, you've got Native Americans banding together to save the environment, to protest the building of, you know, oil lines. I mean, the, the thing to remember is these people, they were speaking over a thousand different languages. So this is by no means to say that this was a homogenous Arctic or Paleo-Eskimo culture. They were thousands of um, different cultural groups with slightly different beliefs, but the idea is that they were actually able to communicate with each other, they were able to trade. We're not talking about the small isolated communities that were, you know, living in their own little igloos. I think it, it's meant to challenge our conception of what the Arctic might have been as this vast place, um, this vast landscape. So I don't, I mean, I don't know the answer to your question. I think it's going to vary depending on who you, who you talk to. That's a good answer. <laughs> are these uh, figures, or are they, do they have charm or, or uh, good luck or why? Is there any knowledge of what they're, are they just for the entertainment? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, we know that there are certain types of animals that show up repeatedly carved. Mm -hmm. um, seals and whales in particular, objects that are animals that probably had symbolic value, but also were things that sustained communities. Um, you know, so that's, fortunately, Kevin Smith, really, I'm going to throw this right out there, is the one who curated this area in Native North America mm -hmm. isn't my exact area of expertise, but a lot of these objects were actually excavated by Brown University archaeologists, mm -hmm. beginning with uh, John uh, Giddings. <laughs> the anthropology department uh, building is named after him. Um, later, Doug Anderson, who's still a faculty member at Brown, still teaching, still doing research, um, and Kevin and other members of the team. So I'm not trying to pass the buck, but that's no, definitely a question I'll next time. Kevin, next, time see next time you see Kevin, you can certainly ask so, him that question. But there is a really rich history that connects these objects to Brown and Brown research over decades. That's great. Mm -hmm. yeah, so to what extent was permafrost and cold, cold environment uh, influenced how much this, this object preserves? I guess you have many objects you preserve because frozen one. Yeah, the question, um, just in case people didn't hear it, was how much does the environment, in terms of it being cold and permafrost, permafrost how much did that affect the preservation? Um, 
It likely did help. It also makes accessing them a lot more difficult. I think you could ask any Arctic archaeologist what it's like to try to dig through layers upon layers of frozen dirt. It's not, it's not fun. Um, I mean, preservation certainly depends to a large extent on what materials things are made out of. Um, and you're right, over here we're seeing a lot more organics um, in terms of ivory and wood rather than stone, inorganic objects like stone and pottery, which tend to preserve pretty well, which is why you're going to see a lot of stone and pottery in the rest of the exhibit. Um, so certainly I think more so than it being frozen, uh, it has to do more with how dry the conditions are. So moving over um, here, we've got a discussion of the Southwest and the, um, you know, Pueblo communities of the American Southwest. And one of the things that we're looking at is the Anasazi, in particular, of the Chaco Canyon, were known for producing um, black and white pottery with these incredibly complex geometric techniques. And archaeologists haven't entirely been able to decode if there was any uh, meaning behind this or whether they were just decorations and recent uh, some ethno historic and ethnographic work has actually shown that there's a strong possibility that the cross hatching that you that is very common in these pieces of pottery here let me move over here so other folks can get to see um, the cross hatching actually might have symbolically represented turquoise or blue which I think um, most folks are probably aware that turquoise is a natural, naturally occurring raw material in the American Southwest, and it was prized by a lot of native cultures and was traded vastly all the way down through South America, and that it probably had a very strong symbolic significance. However, blue pigment is amongst the hardest to reproduce because it's very difficult to find naturally occurring blue um, materials to make dyes um, <laughs> and other sorts of paint, especially in the Southwest. In the Americas, really only two groups of people were able to produce blue, and there's evidence that it was only after hundreds of years of failure and a lot of experimentation. So although they were unable to produce a blue pigment, pigment they were still representing it using black and white. And so you can see down in the lower left-hand corner, a former graphic designer was actually able to reproduce what not what they might have looked like, but um, how those people in Chaco were actually viewing and understanding these objects. And then finally over here we have a discussion of Cahokia, which is a topic that, you know, again, archaeologists are discussing as being sort of an empire and a large city in North America. Hmm. One of the sort of misconceptions about Native American archaeology is that the large cities and these vast empires and trade networks were really confined to sort of Central and South America, people like the Aztec and the Inca. Um, but that Native Americans in the northern portion were living in these smaller tribes that weren't really communicating or weren't integrated. Um, and evidence from Cahokia suggests that this is quite possibly not the truth at all, that there might have been um, vast cities you see a reproduction here um, at the site called Cahokia suggesting that uh, the landscape might have actually looked quite different from what we assumed and the map down here you can see that yellow portion that's the area where we start seeing artifacts associated with this particular cultural phenomenon spread. So all the way from the southern tip of Florida up into the northern Midwest. So mm. there is increasing evidence of um, empire building in North America. Going along the Mississippi? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mississippian is another um, Mississippianization. Uh, that's <laughs> a definitely a made-up word uh, within anthropology. But yes, along the Mississippi, which is probably used as a central trade and communication route, um, which refers to sort of the adoption of not all, but you know, selected traits and implements like, you know, hoe blades, which they're not much to look at perhaps, but they suggest a level of agricultural industry that really archaeologists, until recently archaeologists hadn't realized was occurring in this continent. Are these the mound people? Yes. The famous mound builders. 
As we move over here, we are slowly moving south, if that um, perhaps was apart from the Amazon where we started. Um, you know, we've kind of gone from the Arctic down into North America, and now we're going into an area that archaeologists refer to as Mesoamerica, which literally translates as Middle America. Um, it's not a geographic term. There's Central America, um, and there's South America, and there's North America. But Mesoamerica refers to an area that runs from the northern two-thirds of, uh, sorry, the southern two-thirds of Mexico down to, down through the Isthmus of Panama, basically. So it does largely correlate to Central America, but the term actually refers to the fact that although there were diverse and unique cultures of people, the names of whom you've heard and we'll talk about, um, there are still some shared iconography, there seems to be shared architectural style, shared religious beliefs and other sorts of practices that unite these people as a whole while also recognizing that there were huge distinctions between them. Um, so we begin here with, um, these are all artifacts related to the classic Maya, which I'm sure most of you have heard of the Maya. Um, and part of the reason that the Maya have been so famous is because they are really the only ancient culture from this hemisphere that has produced a writing system that archaeologists are able to recognize as such and are actually able to read. About 85%, perhaps upwards now, of Maya hieroglyphs are able to be deciphered and read. Um, and if you look behind you and over there, you'll see some rubbings of stela, which were enormous monuments. These are actual rubbings, so the, these are life-size and to scale. But you'll see in this corner, and then down here, this is what Maya writing looked like. So it's quite foreign from our own alphabet. Um, we call them hieroglyphs, but they're also very different from Egyptian hieroglyphs. This is a combination of phonetic writing and what we call ideographic writing. Phonetic writing uh, distinguishes Maya, the Maya writing system, from Egyptian. They're actually recording sounds here which is different from a purely ideographic, which is a symbol stands for an idea. Um, so it's incredibly complex. Decipherment began uh, you know, as early as the late 19th century, but it's really only been within the past 50 or 60 years that decipherment has really um, picked up. And what archaeologists have learned is that almost all of the inscriptions detail historical events. They give dates, they give birthdays, deaths, days of marriages, days of accession to the throne, um, and they record important events like war, those things that I just mentioned. This has given archaeologists, in conjunction with very thorough and systematic archaeology in the region, a very focused understanding of what the Maya socio-political culture was like. They understand relationships between this site and that site, not only because of the artifacts found there, but because the Maya themselves documented it. Of course, we have to take everything they say with a grain of salt. There are not many times that lost battles or you know kings who have been killed or captured. That's not really mentioned by the losers, as you know, <laughs> as any as, as is true of any history. But it really has helped us understand a lot, um, and has actually allowed us to name in Maya rulers who are depicted. It has been able to us to identify tombs and burials and skeletons of kings with their actual names, and we'll know what they did. Um, and so you'll see over here, um, these are some, just some other examples of my artifacts. And I'm just going to point out two kind of, or there's two vessels in here, this and this one up here, which if you look very closely, you might be able to make out some glyphs. But they're actually what we call pseudoglyphs. They're fake writing. They don't mean anything. Um, which, this is a question that is really intriguing to epigraphers, people who specialize in the study of ancient texts and languages, because they don't know why people are doing it. Does it describe a loss of literacy? Is it that people who maybe aren't literate are trying to emulate the status of those who were able to read and those who were able to sort of afford goods that had actual writing on it? Um, but this has led to one of the biggest questions right now, which is really ancient literacy. 
which opens up whole other questions about stratification of society, occupational specialization, etc. Um, so this is one of the burning questions in my archaeology and epigraphy right now. Hmm. I could keep going about the Maya. So are there any questions? <laughs> that almost looks like a death mask. Which one? Or both? The middle one. The middle one. She said that almost looks like a death mask. These two um, portraits are fascinating. We actually think the one in the middle, I don't want to put my laser on it because it's stuck up and be a little fragile, um, which still has red pigment adhering to it. There's a very good likelihood that this came from a site called Palenque, which is a fairly famous site. I guarantee you if you pick up any coffee table book on the Maya, you're going to see a lot of glossy photos of Palenque. Um, which was a unique site in that it represented a lot of their rulers and inhabitants in a fairly naturalistic way. Most depictions of Maya rulers tend to be very stylized, idealized, rather than idiosyncratic. Um, and in fact, one Maya ruler was depicted in several monuments as having six toes. And they actually found, when they found what they presumed was his tomb, they actually found that he had a mutation and had some toes in one of his feet. Um, so you don't get any more idiosyncratic, I think, than that. But there's a very good chance, based on the style and the actual features of this, that yes, this came from Palenque, and that's made of stucco. So it's not ceramic, same as the other one, which probably is from the Tabasco region around Palenque. Um, and they would have been adhered to building facades. So they're actually parts of architectural sculpture. Well, six toes is a dominant trait, believe it or not. I have no idea. It is, but it's dominant, but the percentage of people with six toes is very It's low. not, I was thinking, <laughs> well, I only have five. Well, I have ten toes in total, but. <laughs> So we're going to move over to this case, um, which is really a case to demonstrate what we don't know. The Maya, and to some extent the Aztec, who we'll talk about later, have really dominated a lot of discussions of Mesoamerican cultures. And in large part, the argument is that because there is a writing system, there's so much there to uncover, so much detail, that it's easy to overshadow cultures who were living very close to and at the same time as, even before, the Maya themselves. And everything in this case comes from the classic Veracruz culture, which is located along the Veracruz, uh, in the Veracruz uh, state in Mexico along the Caribbean coast, very close to where the Maya lived. Um, and you can see they had incredibly complex and beautiful artistic forms. Everything in this case is made of ceramic, and you can see over in this seated figure right here, some of that blue pigment that I was saying that the mm. folks in this region were able to recreate. Chemically, it has a unique signature, and it's known as Maya blue, um, mm. even though it is showing up here on a Veracruz artifact. That proves my point that Maya kind of overshadow everything. Um, one of the interesting things that does appear here, however, is if you look at this figure and this seated figure, and this head right here, you're going to see a lot of traits in common, um, including you'll see incised lines on all of their faces, sort of drooping jaws. Um, and maybe, unless you're a specialist in this type of art, their faces are depicted as being fairly saggy <coughs> and often no teeth or missing teeth. Um, this is A, one of the few depictions of the elderly in Mesoamerican art. Like I said, most people tend to be idealized, shown in a state of perpetual beauty. Although standards of that beauty may differ from culture to culture, people were usually shown young and, and really in their prime. All three of these figures represent what is most generically known as the old fire god, who would become later known as Wei Wei Tuatl, in, uh, amongst the Aztec, but this god who is associated in Veracruz culture with home and the hearth um, has ancient, ancient roots in Mesoamerica. It shows up in the Olmec, who many believe were the progenitor culture of Mesoamerica, that sort of all of the other groups that would later <coughs> appear derive from this same group. Um, but he makes appearance with slightly different guises in nearly every other culture. Um, 
there's actually a depiction of God N on this pot amongst the Maya, who is also shown with a sagging face and a toothless jaw. Um, and they're associated with very similar things. So this deity um, actually is quite important. And this large head, you have no idea how heavy this thing is. Um, most likely once, it's only a fragment, um, was most likely the top of an incensario or a censer or a brazier. They kind of all mean the same thing in the literature. But basically incense would have been placed in a bowl or a ceramic dish and burned and this would have been placed on top of it. So that's actually just a lid. Hmm. Are there any other questions about anything in here? It seems unusual to see the smiles and, and that joyfulness. Yes, the um, smiling figures and two mm -hmm. over there. They're known as sonrientes, that means sort of smiling, laughing in Spanish. Um, they all come from a very restricted region, uh, and particularly from one site known as Remojadas, and they're, they're known also as Remojadas figurines. Most of them are mold made. So, I mean, if you kind of come up and look closely, you'll notice that, you know, everything is very uniform. It is one of the rare depictions of smiling people. They were very stoic in Mesoamerica. Um, and their meaning, we really have no idea. Um, are they, ch some people have suggested that they're children. Other people have suggested that they're dancers or musicians. And certainly, I think it's particularly noticeable in this example right here, Throughout Mesoamerica, having a raised foot and raised arms was sort of symbolic of dancing. Um, but again, we don't know. And part of the reason is the lack of written record, especially when compared to other places. Do we know an actual setting of this? No, most of this material from Veracruz and also from uh, the west coast of Mexico, which we're going to be talking about later, um, has been looted. Hmm. In, I mean, in antiquity. There's just not been intense archaeological excavation, again, because a lot of uh, archaeological attention, particularly in the 19th and early 20th centuries, was given over to the Maya and the Aztec, who were over there. Um, so no, we, for these particular figures. So they're, they're misplaced. Archaeologists believe they find them in a different place, to, like, rather than the original. Uh, so yeah, they were not excavated, correct. Oh, probably. So bought from someone. Yes, probably a couple hundred years ago, looters, I mean, we're talking centuries ago, not, you know, just right now, looters were pulling these and, you know, maybe in the 1800s and selling them, yeah. And that, you know, looting is certainly an, an issue that we can talk about after, but there are certain regions, particularly Veracruz and West Mexico, which is next, so we'll start walking over this way, where looting has been particularly prominent. Anonymous just refers to donors who don't want their names. Um, all of them were donated or gifted. None of these objects were purchased. Um, and it raises an interesting question about sort of legality and ethics because UNESCO um, has past provisions, the, the date differs slightly by country, but for instance, most objects that appeared in the U.S. after 1969, for say Mexico or Guatemala, are really considered to be hot black market items. Um, there's a lot of stringent control about how these things uh, change hands. Unfortunately, anything acquired beyond that, no matter how the means, is considered legal by law, whether it's ethical or moral that they might have been looted from a site, that remains, you know, I think, uh, a question of great, great debate. Um, it's too far back to have the records to trace it? Um, no, it's not that. It's just when, it's whenever individual countries ratified an international convention mm. that dictates the trade, sale, and purchase of antiquities, basically. Yeah. So it's, no, the further back you can trace documentation, usually, the better. Oh. Um, Again, at least it, we know that it is legal by international standards. Um, so in this case, we're moving into two, or well, this whole area is actually talking about uh, the connections that were uh, upheld between Mesoamerica um, from areas as far south as Costa Rica, shown down here, 
up to sort of northwestern Mexico here. And we've got coast, just, so you, just to orient you, we've got Costa Rican objects over there, and we've got West Mexican and Central Mexican objects here. Um, and all of these pieces, you see sort of in this half, uh, come from a region of West Mexico, which like the Amazon is increasingly seeing archeological activity and excavation, but is quite possibly one of the most heavily looted areas um, of the Americas in terms of grave robbing. So unfortunately, we have amazing artifacts, and by we, I don't necessarily mean the Hafen Art Museum, it's just the archeologi archeological community at Y, have amazing artifacts. We suspect that most of them came from tombs because of excavated examples that, uh, where we have provenience, we know that they were coming from tombs. But without archeological context, it's very difficult to place them at a specific date and time. We don't know exactly when they were made. It's difficult to tell us anything about their use or function because we don't know where they were found um, or their meaning because we're unable to discern patterns of where certain types of things placed in this area where certain types of things used in this way. Um, and the same is, is definitely true of a lot of these pieces. We suspect that they were funerary ceramics because a lot of the excavated areas in West Mexico were these large shaft tombs. Um, and certainly we see a lot of representations of animals show up in these tombs, particularly dogs. And we know through Pan Mesoamerican example that dogs were considered um, guides into the underworld. So there does seem to be some sort of uh, connection there. And then these two examples right here, this is Zapotec, and this is a Mixtec urn slightly later. Um, these were definitively funerary in nature. Um, the site of Monte Alban, which is a very famous uh, niche tech site in Oaxaca in Mexico. Um, there's a temple there that's literally adorned with all sorts of depictions of this particular deity. And you can, you, know, you can read more specifics about there. He's known as Casillo. He's a storm god. And then this piece right here is actually a loan from the RISD Museum. Um, and that's an Aztec, a stone Aztec sculpture um, of a spider monkey who symbolized a lot of things to the Aztec, including um, drunkenness and dancing and singing and sort of all things gluttonous and extravagant. Um, so he's kind of a fun guy. I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name for you because the video camera will make me nervous. But you can see. The name's right there if you want to, <laughs> if you want to do that. And if you're very good at saying like four consonants in a row, feel free. Um, Xochitl and Marco Milo Xochitl. Yes. <laughs> so over here, we're just going to move briefly into some Costa Rican materials. Um, Costa Rica is particularly known for providing us with a lot of examples of matates, which appear all over. They're used for grinding corn. And you can see they did appear in um, various shapes, although this is the most common. You would have a roller, and you would just roll corn kernels to make a powder. Yeah. Um, particularly, Costa Rica is famous for its jades, which I know when I was curating this exhibit, that's all my mom wanted to know about. How many jades are there? <laughs> um, so if you're interested in jade, you can see some here. A lot of them were uh, carved into celts that would be placed along belts. And this occurs all over Mesoamerica. It's associated with dancing, because they would they do if you accidentally happen to touch two of them together, they make a very scary sound that makes uh, our collections manager cringe. Um, <laughs> but they make a very distinctive sound that if when moved um, during dancing or other, other rituals, most likely would have uh, produced quite, quite beautiful music. Um, and a lot of them have bird features. Um, Perhaps more so than anything else, jade has also been heavily looted, and also there are a lot of, um, they're being produced for tourist art, a lot of things people like to collect these. But interestingly, jade sourcing, that is using chemical and other laboratory analyses, archaeologists are able to place exactly where the jade was taken from. So there's really only two major sources in the region which is leading to a lot of discussions about possible trade. Jade was a, a material that was valued almost universally from the American Southwest all the way down into the northern areas of South America. Yes, the 
the question is, is there any correlation between the designs and the textiles and the pottery? Absolutely, and that's one of the main reasons why archaeologists believe that it's not that the Paracas people died out entirely, but that there was some sort of slow migration and transformation um, into slightly different emphases. Over here in some of the textiles, um, you'll see sort of, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to use the pointer on the textiles. On the fragment, the left, the fragment to the left in the red, um, that's called the, the flying shaman, sort of in popular literature, but it's an anthropomorphic deity. And over to the right, you've got um, stylized killer whales, and these were very sacred to the people of Caracas. But in most of the textiles, it tends to focus on um, gods, animals, and agricultural products. You start seeing those same motifs appear in Nazca pottery. Some of the earlier examples, which are over here, the little sort of finger-like things emanating from this person's head are actually thought to be peppers. And then you've obviously got birds feasting on corn cobs, so those agricultural motifs <coughs> are replicated. As time goes on, you start seeing more emphasis of violence and warfare. Um, like trophy heads, decapitated heads. Um, this also represents a trophy head. So there is a subtle shift. There's a continuation, but there is a shift in emphasis, although nothing completely disappears. And then finally, we move into the Caribbean. And we chose to end here because, well, I think for obvious reasons, but this was the area where Native North Americans discovered Europeans. Um, <coughs> And the Caribbean is also an area that archaeologists are um, beginning to investigate with a little bit more thoroughness and systematic excavation. And what they're finding is that there are certainly traditions that seem to be sort of pan-Mesoamerican. If you look over here at this map, which is slightly small, you can see that the Caribbean islands mm -hmm. are actually very close to Central America, and there is absolutely evidence that there was contact by way of sea between these two, um, these two groups. We, in fact, see some artifacts that were produced by the Taino, which we're going to talk about, that show up at Maya sites in coastal Belize and the Yucatan. So certainly there was a um, connection between them, and also the ball game, um, which was a pan-Mesoamerican sport, where we have um, evidence of ball courts and other um, artifacts associated with the game, which I'll show you over there, um, showing up in the Caribbean as well as other places in Mesoamerica. All of these um, pieces in all three of these cases are Taino artifacts, and the Taino are sort of famously known as the, the people that Columbus really did make first contact with. Um, they sort of developed from a long line of Caribbean occupants, so people had lived there for thousands of years before sort of what is culturally recognized the Taino showed up. Um, but they're particularly known for a category of artifact known as zemis, which is, they're all in this case here, these little stone figures, which were basically little effigy figures. Um, and we do have some ethnohistoric documents from people aboard Columbus's Actually, all of Columbus's voyage, who describes that these were used in shamanistic rituals and curing rituals, and in, um, even in everyday households, you would have a zemi and you would build a shrine to it. Um, and also, these tri trigonoliths, three pointers, they're known as various things. Um, these strange three point stones, which uh, we don't know exactly what they mean, um, but they seem to have been objects of extreme importance to the Taino. Um, but again, the significance isn't known, even from, you know, ethnohistoric documents when we have them. Do you know if they were found in the mountains or by the sea? <laughs> again, it's the same question of most of these were not excavated okay. objects. And in the Caribbean, the situation is a little bit different. Um, rather than looting, a lot of the reason we don't have provenience for a lot of these objects has more to do with development and construction. Um, as the islands have become increasingly popular for tourists, as you know, sort of local populations have expanded, and the overall region has become, for lack of a better word, more modernized, construction projects turn up all sorts of things. And so it's 
unfortunate because we end up losing that careful stratigraphic information that would help us understand these objects a little bit better. Um, but that, that is the, definitely the situation with a lot of Caribbean um, pieces. And, and some of ours were, were collected by Peace Corps workers who happened to be there and to, to save them um, and to donate them to various museums for learning purposes. Um, so you can see some examples of pottery that they used, as well as you know, sort of mortars and pestles for grinding corn. Body stamps. You would have put paint on them and then stamped them on your body. Um, and then really wonderful uh, stone tools, which you see behind here, as well as some objects associated with the ball game. So this was a belt that would have been worn around the waist. Um, some stone balls. I would not have wanted to play this game, I don't think. Um, <laughs> as well as some green, stone, uh, some green stone celts. And we don't know, again, it's very difficult to tell whether these uh, celts, which are made of this beautiful green stone, um, were actually used in everyday, you know, for everyday agricultural pursuits, you know, for building houses, et cetera, or whether they were ritual in purpose. And again, I think only careful excavation with an eye towards recovering context is gonna, is gonna tell us what those, what those were used for. Questions about the Taino material? I just have the observation that the ones in the end, the uh, triangular ones, sure look an awful lot like oversized shark's teeth. <laughs> it, every, uh, there have been a lot of um, there has been a lot of hypothesis about what they might be. I always looked at the one on the end and thought it looked like a little snail. Um, this one you can't see it quite as well because it's quite eroded. The one in the middle actually has two animal faces yeah. projecting. On the side, and the size of these can vary enormously. Um, you know, they can be very small, almost you know, the same scale as this, or they can be nearly monumental. Um, and certainly, they're they're recorded in European documents as like being there and existing, but there's very little discussion of how they were used or what they they might have meant. <coughs> Sharks' teeth are certainly possible. The Caribbean is. <laughs> Obviously, uh, known for its aquatic resources. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, are there any descendants of Taino people in Caribbean right now? Hmm? Like descendants of Taino people in Caribbean by any chance? Like, so you have like my descendants in Mesoamerica, but do you have Taino? Yes. At least evidence that some population. Yes, um, there is absolute firm evidence that descendants of the Taino. Um, are still very much amongst us, including DNA evidence. And there's actually been a huge resurgence, sort of a cultural revival um, of the Taino, particularly in Puerto Rico, um, of people who are claiming Taino heritage and descendants, whether or not, you know, genetically or however you want to look at it, whether or not they are very close descendants, there certainly seems to have been this reappropriation of their indigenous roots. Um, and really interesting, the language that the Taino spoke was Arawak. And a lot of the words that are in our everyday vocabulary, like hammock, and barbecue, and canoe, those are actually Arawak words. That's how they entered our language. So I mean, not only are they still living, we have appropriated and naturalized all of these things, um, probably without even knowing where they came from. But they're basically words from that language that the Spanish put into theirs and you know, were slowly adopted into English. But yeah, definitely, there's, um, I, actually, I live in New York City, and uh, the Puerto Rican Day Parade happened, and there was actually a whole other, not only was it Puerto Rican Day Parade, but there were also people who were claiming their Taino Puerto Rican identities themselves. Um, so yeah, no, they're, they're definitely claiming it back. Anything else? I invite you guys to look around the gallery. If you have specific questions, I'm, I'm here all day. <laughs> <laughs> One question about the exhibit as a whole. The